This episode of Dion Extended is brought to you by DigitalOcean and Bitwarden. Welcome to episode 77 of DLN Extend. DLN Extend is a community-powered podcast. We take conversations from the DLN community, from places like the DLN discourse forums, telegram groups, discourse servers, and more. We also take topics from other shows around the network and give our takes. And with me are the fine co-hosts that I unfortunately do not get to spend enough time with sometimes because life gets crazy. Wendy, the photographer extraordinaire, and Nate, the retro gamer with an unhealthy obsession with OpenSUSE. Let's go ahead, guys. Well, I'm really excited to talk to you guys today. Yeah, well, at first, Matt wasn't going to be with us, and now he is with us. Yeah, it's like Christmas all over again. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> life goes that way sometimes. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> well, you know, speaking of games, I guess I'll just go right into it. <laughs> I left the oh. intro there and they just kind of sidelined Well, me. <laughs> yes. You know, I'm actually really good at derailing conversations. <laughs> A shock. <laughs> Which is why I'm surprised I haven't been fired from this podcast yet. But anyway, I'm really excited because thanks to Matt this week, I learned of something called Mini GOG or Mini GOG. I don't know what you call it. Mini Galaxy. Mini Galaxy. Whatever you want to call it. I'm able to use all of my repository of games that I purchased on GOG on a nice interface to use it on my Linux machine, my new T64 imposter computer. So I installed several games, some like Wine and also the native Linux installs, and everything just seems to work just as well, with the exception of one game, but that's not important. I have this new problem now. I'm running out of storage space, or it's narrowing, and it's making me a little bit nervous because I see the direction that this is going. So I ordered a second drive for the computer to have internally, just for a fun drive. I'll probably mount it and call it fun, put all the fun stuff on there. But there's space for two additional drives in this computer, so I will put at least one in there for now. I ordered a one terabyte SSD. It was like $95, I guess. It's really not that expensive right now just to put all the games and so forth on. So I'm really excited about that. But I do have to also blame Matt further enabling me into doing more games because one, he showed me this mini galaxy and he also sent me a bunch of games on GOG. So I got like, I think it was like 24 games that you sent me, Matt. What was it? Something like that. I would never, ever enable people to game. Yeah, it's just like, so here, take another hit. Here, take another hit. Here's another game. I was very excitedly installing things this morning. Four games so far I installed this morning. Played with them just a little bit just to see that they work. I'm giddy. So I'm going to be doing some playing of games. There's a little bit of time opening up here and there for some entertainment. I'm jealous. I'm jealous of the time that you have for a little bit of entertainment. I mean, I have to get up early for the entertainment. I cut yes. into sleep is what I do since I can't do it at night. It's okay. Sleep's overrated. <laughs> so who needs it? Yeah. Okay. So who needs need sleep? sleep? Isn't there a song that's... I don't want to work. I just want to bang on my keyboard all day. Is that how it goes? Well, there's that one. Yes. <laughs> I was actually thinking of two that specifically say that who needs sleep or sleep is for the week. Yeah. Mm. I don't need sleep. That's about right. Wendy, when I'm not gaming or when I am gaming, what kind of things are you going to be doing with your Pine phone? Right now, I'm still not doing anything with my dang Pine phone. I was really hoping that during the course of us having a cold, not going to co-ops last week, that I was going to have time to get the Pine phone set up and not really. I mean, what was I thinking when you have kids with a cold, especially my youngest, who was a super snuggler, and he really didn't get the cold much at all. It barely even touched him. There is no extra time, even though our outside activities were canceled. So I didn't get to do that yet, even though I want to. So I'll just keep you up to date as we go through it. And when I finally do get a chance to play with it some more, I'll let you know. But yesterday, we were back to a co-op, and one of my students wasn't going to be there for Tuesday co-op. And there were several things that we were doing that day, which the student needed to participate in, in order to help reach the goals for the end of the semester. And so I figured, hey, I've got stuff to record audio, let's see if I can't record the class and be able to share it with the student afterwards. So I took my USB interface, I took my shotgun microphone, and of course my XLR cable, and then I connected that all up to my Microsoft Surface 6 and recorded the entire class. I got home and the audio quality really isn't great. And I know that's one of the reasons that I switched from using that shotgun microphone because it really does gather all of the audio in the room. It was a really, really big room that we're in. 
And so there's just a whole lot of extra background noise and all of that kind of stuff. I'm hoping that I will be able to clean it up and be able to share it with the student, but I was really disappointed in how the audio came out. And I need to start looking into what are some of the setups that I can do different because as we go through the rest of this semester, as we go into next semester, there's going to be additional students that can't make it to class for whatever reason. And I still want them to participate in the discussions or be able to listen back to the discussions because that is one of the best parts of the class. It's one of the reasons that I absolutely love being a part of classes like this is the discussion is so so much a part of the learning process. So I've got some bugs to work out. I really wish the audio would have came up better and we'll see what I can do with it to make it usable at this point for the student to listen to because it's not like it's 15 minutes, 20 minutes. There's almost two hours of audio in which the student would have to sit through in order to get the full context of stuff and nobody wants to hear <laughs> in the background as people are talking. Work to do there. But hopefully, with my growing skills in tenacity, I can get it somewhat more manageable. Is that something where you can get rid of dead space and tenacity, like spaces of silence? Is that a feature you could use? It's not so much the spaces of silence that I need to be removed. It's I need to play with the noise reduction side of it, and I need to see... The problem that I'm having is when I first ran the noise reduction on a section, it cut out way too much of the voices at the same time but the section that I was using also had because a lot of the times we can hear the kids that aren't in class the younger kids that aren't participating in the classes they're in a big room that's behind us and even though for the most part the door is shut they're still 25 kids in there on a full day. So it's loud, even with the door shut and all of that done. And in that section, you could hear them. And so I need to play with it for a little bit and see if I can't get a really good section of room noise. And if I would have been thinking at the beginning of class, I would have gotten a room noise sample, a nice like 10, 15 second one so that I would have all of that data to help with the noise reduction. I'm just going to need to kind of scrub through it and try and figure out where the best sample is to take that noise reduction and kind of play with some of the settings to try and get it knocked down. And then using the, I think it's the leveler feature. I'd have to look at it again. But using some of the plugins that I use when we are, when I'm cleaning up the voice audio in the end, it'll take off a bit at the beginning and a bit at the end of the sound wave in those different hertz ranges, which are sounds that are typically not within the human voice. And I don't know if that kind of processing will help too. There's just a whole lot of playing I'm going to have to do with it. It's going to be a trial and error process. I don't know how good it's going to get, but we'll see. How much time do you have to spend editing it out? I mean, I guess there's a lot of probably just dead air or useless bits of information. So it's probably going to be a lot of like listening to it before you can publish it or whatever. There really isn't that much to edit out. So there is a five minute section where the kids have a break. So that part will be needed to edit out. But most of the class is either part of the lecture we didn't have time for book discussion. A kid did the presentation yesterday, and then we did a document study. So really, when I'm saying that this is a two-hour class that we have with the kids, that two hours is full. We are packed full full of stuff. And most of that time that I have recorded is actual stuff to listen to. There won't be much cutting. It'll just be a matter of trying to clean out the background noise. I got you. So it's easier to listen to. We're basically using the tools that we use to make education better in your world. That's awesome. Trying to anyway. And thanks to open source and my love of hardware, I had options to start that with. And over the course of this, I'll be figuring out ways to make it better so that it's cleaner and easier for more kids and me in cases where someone can't make it again. Very awesome. It's time in our house for a new phone. Magneto has pretty much destroyed his. I hear you've already picked up a new phone, Matt. I would never pick up new phones. For those that don't know, I have a, I guess, recognized phone. I can call it whatever you want. My daily driver for the most part right now is a Sonom XP8. Let's just call it a tank. <laughs> the problem is it's up to Android 10, which 
for a small OEM like these guys, that's actually pretty good. They've been fairly consistent with the updates and that kind of stuff. It's getting long in the tooth. You can tell it's an older phone. I say only four gigs, but most laptops that some people use <coughs> mate, don't even have four gigs. You can just tell it's getting old. <laughs> you know, typical Android mentality as far as that. I'm a hardware guy, Wendy, believe it or not. You know, we always poke fun at my weird hardware. I love the foldable phone idea. I just don't like the price tag associated with it. That is just absurd to me. I am not spending the seventeen, eighteen hundred dollars for a foldable phone. Well, I didn't. <laughs> so I ended up buying a foldable phone. I ended up going with the Moto Razor 5G. Oh, I thought it was gonna be like the original Razor. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that is foldable. You are correct. No, I went with this particular model because being a hardware guy, I like the idea of folding phones. I just don't like a lot of the price association with it. And it is new technology, so I understand that. New tech, it's iterative, so costs go down the more you iterate on it. Through carrier upgrades and all that stuff, this phone was on sale for 500 bucks, like retail buy cost. That was like, oh, cool. The closest competition to this thing, you know, to the Razer was the Samsung Z Flip or whatever, you know, model Z, Z Flip 3, which is $1,000 to start. What I plan on doing with this is I want to see how many avenues of privacy invasiveness that is generically within Android can you kind of cut off? That's kind of the project because we were kind of discussing a little bit in the pre-show. People like me, people like you, you know, people who are willing to install custom ROMs and go through kind of the headaches that can go with that are very few and far between as far as generic consumers. What's the lowest barrier to entry to help people take back even some level of control? I'm curious because iOS and all these other ones kind of play that up. Oh, we're secure and blah, blah, blah till we're not. What can be done from a privacy perspective and not have to go to the lengths that some of us will go to have that privacy taken back, shall we say? Do you really want to go and deal with all the stuff of like flashing a Samsung phone, Wendy? Not really, mainly because Samsung is one of the biggest pains in the bum to do that with. It's getting harder, isn't it? It's getting harder to find companies that will willingly keep their bootloaders unlocked so you can... Flash whatever the heck you want. Yeah, so unless you go Sony, because Sony's really good, especially with the changes that they've made. So a Sony is a great one, but they have limited newer phones that are available. So you're going to have to be shopping the used market to get one that's somewhat affordable. Yeah, Sony makes good phones, but they come at a price tag. I think it's the Xperia 1, 2, or I don't Sony's naming convention for their phones are weird. Yeah, that weird named one is their newest. It was well over. <laughs> Over what most even the folding phones are. Yeah. Hard to justify that. Taking more of a basic approach is like, if you want comparison to OS is like, okay, how do you make Windows less privacy invasive? What do you turn off? What do you shut? You know, just bare basics kind of thing. I don't think we being in that sphere really take that consumer-ish kind of approach. We take a like, oh, well, I'll just nuke and pave this thing and call it good. So that's how I solve it. But that's not how everybody solves it. So how do we bring in more people so that we can at least take back a little bit of some of those avenues that get invaded constantly, even on the platforms that, let's be real, from the biggest advertising company on the planet. I can't speak for many phones, but I have been pretty happy with how Motorola has left their bootloaders unlocked. I put Lineage on a G7 power, and that was pretty trivial, really. I do have a newer Moto phone now because of network compatibility, but there is no ROM available for this at this time. I'm interested in seeing how that would go to flash that, but right now I'm kind of stuck with what I got. Unless there's another other option out there besides Lineage OS I could throw on there. And it really depends on the model of phone from Motorola, and that may be more related to which phones get into the hands of the developers. The G line definitely seems to have more ROMs available for it. It is definitely on the lower end in the spectrum price-wise, and maybe that's why there's more ROMs for them, just because more people have them in hand as compared to some of the other Motorola phones. Unless the phones are either uber popular there's a reason people have put up with the headaches of the Samsungs and all the other stuff. Then there are other phones that I know for a while, I haven't looked recently, the OnePlus line for a while was very popular. I can't speak currently because I haven't looked at XDA and all the other stuff. It really does depend on the make and model and that kind of stuff. Really availability to more of the everyday end user that would be a developer. We don't all have 
hundred dollars to go drop on the latest greatest kind of deal. Some do, but most of us don't. So the short version is that's kind of what my idea for getting the new phone was anyway. It was a little bit of price. It was a little bit of tech hardware addicts, unfortunately. It was just time to upgrade in general and figure out how to de-Google your life a bit or gain back some privacy from the OS that most people will generically use on a phone at this point. I'm curious to see how that screen holds up. I watched some reviews online. I think it's the same phone. I'm not exactly sure if there's multiple of that name or whatnot. It sounded pretty crusty after a while of like opening and closing it, that double hinge system on it. I'm interested in seeing how yours holds up, if a crease starts forming or if it delaminates or, or something along those lines. Guess I'll find out. Yeah, that's a pretty expensive test, in my opinion. That's why we <laughs> still have backup phones, though. Oh, yeah. I didn't say I was getting rid of the current phones. Right. And I do have all the protection crap on it just in case because I was like, I'm not dropping 500 bones for this to break in a month. <laughs> When do you get it? It's showing up tomorrow. Oh my gosh. I was looking at just because I was interested in seeing these foldable phones. I cannot work out in my head how that's going to hold up. Like what I know of live hinges. It's second gen tech at best. Yeah, well, and at least some of the first bugs are worked out because there was definitely issues with the original one from Samsung Fold and the delamination and all of that stuff. So that's definitely something to worry about. And I know it's not a phone I could ever hand to Magneto. <laughs> Just because the dirt and all of that stuff that would get between the, yeah, it just, no, that so wouldn't work at all. That wouldn't last two seconds of a magneto. Yeah, exactly. And how do I put that in a case for him? Because he's not allowed to touch a phone that's not in a case, let alone pack a phone like that that I can't put in a case. This episode of Deal and Extend is brought to you by DigitalOcean. Now's the perfect time to dive into DigitalOcean. Their new app platform service helps you build modern cloud-native apps for way less money. With App Platform, you can build, deploy, and scale apps and static websites faster and easier than ever using a simple, intuitive interface. Simply point App Platform to your GitHub or GitLab repository and let it do all the heavy lifting. Whether you're using Node.js, Python, Go, PHP, Ruby, static sites, Docker, and containers. By running App Platform on their own infrastructure, DigitalOcean keeps your costs significantly lower than any other products. Plus, it's built on top of DigitalOcean Kubernetes, providing a smoother migration path so you can take more control of your infrastructure setup, too. As a DLN Extend listener and a member of the DLN community, you can get started building your world-changing app on their app platform for free. And it gets better. DigitalOcean will give you a $100 credit when you sign up at do.co slash DLN. Again, go to do.co slash DLN to get started with your free $100 credit on DigitalOcean's new app platform. We want to thank DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of DLN Extend. Well, speaking of new hardware for me, new software for Nate, Wendy working with software, let's talk about what's new coming to Linux, and that's some new software that not a lot of us thought would ever really happen. I scratched that because we are fulfilling a prediction that you made on our New Year's show. You're not wrong. I will say I did paint the circumstances of how that may come to very, 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 very broadly, though. Yes, you did. But that was also an extremely bold thing to put out there at the same time. True, because I did say it was either going to be the community that came up with a workaround or they were just going to officially support it. It kind of covered both avenues. And well, for those that are wondering, Easy Anti-Cheat and Battle Eye are coming to Lennox. And I know there's going to be groans and from a lot of the purists and stuff about why would you want this malware on your system and blah, 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 blah. Really, at the end of the day, we want more people to use a secure, privacy-focused base. What they decide to put on it is not my problem, nor should it be yours. Because really, we value the choice. I'm totally cool with that. Because what these things allow is people to have their systems and play the games that they want, that they have bought, and, you know, whatever. The fact that this gives developers more options for new platforms. I'm okay with that. The fact that this is targeting Proton, Linux Native, and all the other stuff, 
I totally love. They have made it, apparently, paraphrasing here, have made it easy enough within the newest SDKs of EAC and BattleEye to enable support for Proton. Now, some people will groan, oh, it's supporting Proton. It's not native. Wah. Win some, lose some. Do you really care how it works as long as it works on your system at the end of the day? I don't care if it's programmed in C. I don't care if it's programmed in Rust. Whatever you decide, my system runs it, then hey, Cool. So I think this is a great win, especially with things like the Steam Deck coming out. This will help push Linux gaming forward. And for those that think, oh, what do I care about gaming? I don't do it. That graphics stack, that Wayland support, all that stuff will help you in the long run. That's why stuff like this matters to me. People think it's just like very singular focus and it's like, nah, this helps the ecosystem. We talk about Linux wins with the commercialization of stuff, starts hitting it, we're seeing it. Yeah, this is really exciting. The excitement part here is not that I'm going to be playing these AAA titles necessarily. Maybe. I'm excited because now it's saying you can buy the Steam Deck or you can use Linux to play your games or you can use Windows. Now it's like a real option to say, hey, this is now an option. Here's what my question is going to be for easy anti-cheat and bad life. Is it going to be tied to Chrome OS? Is it going to be for Steam? Or how does that work? I mean, aren't they kind of low-level systems that make sure you're not cheating? Like, will it work on all different flavors of Linux? Will it only work on specific flavors? So what I've seen thus far anyway, information-wise, is that it's not tied strictly to just to like the Steam Deck or it's not Steam Deck specific, that it's tied to more Proton. So if you're using Proton, they don't generically care. That's what it takes for them to target that. Honestly, I don't care. The fact that you can now play your, you know, Rainbow Six Siege and like all these big competitive shooters and all this other stuff that are really important to a lot of people. I think that's a great win because it opens up the market to new opportunities. It's really important to a lot of people. And the reason that a lot of people still dual boot is because they can't play those games on Linux right now. And so they need to have both systems because they're not giving up a game that they love for a single operating system. Just like I wouldn't expect my daughter to give up painting because of one particular item. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's a win-win for everybody in that realm because it gives people who want to use Linux more options when it comes to the gaming world. And that's just one more resource in the back end for developers for the growth of Linux on the desktop and so many other things. It doesn't matter that I don't play those games because really we've all seen Wendy play first person shooters. I'm not playing any game that needs an anti-cheat. Mm, no. <laughs> but it's really cool that other people can. For me, this is not just about proprietary software, you know, low level stuff. Nate, the one you're specifically thinking of is for a game called Valorant, I believe is from Riot, the guys who do League of Legends. Okay. That is probably the most evasive DRM probably since Star Force that I've seen as far as like just how low it goes. Generically, Star Force and I believe the way the Valorant anti-cheat works is it goes down to ring zero for Windows level. That means it's booting before your OS kind of deal, which that I have a problem with. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty dang invasive. That is like uber invasive stuff. These, from my understanding, like don't go that low. You're enabling it for Proton, which is call it compatibility layer, call it an emulation, whatever you want to call it. That's more of an, I don't want to say strictly a software level, but the way it's probably accessing it is probably going to be different than what it would be in a default Windows system, just because of the way the calls would have to be made and translated to Linux calls for Wine and the Wine backend to understand it. I think it's going to be a little bit different. The one thing I do want to mention, though, is that this is dependent on developers clicking those switches to turn it on. So some may, some may not. At the end of the day, if you are a Linux gamer who wants to use games with EAC and BattleEye, politely ask these developers to turn those options on. Yelling and screaming, like some of us do in the community, does not help. We don't need a Witcher 3 situation all over again. <laughs> okay, I have no idea what that means. Remember, you're talking to someone who is just learning games? The Witcher 2 came out and uses a technology called Aeon, which was a private forked version of wine, essentially. Like, there's more to it than that. Performance was really, really bad. 
A lot of people whine, complain, made death threats, which is the part I don't like even more. Ooh. As a customer, you have every right to say that this is a crappy product for what it is. Yeah. Totally fine with that. Once you start getting into the death threats and all the other stuff, that's when I have a problem. And that's what happened. People want to know why there's no native Witcher 3 on Linux. Well, that's why. The reception to The Witcher 2 was abysmal from the community. I mean, it was abysmal product at launch. It did not run well. I get it. But when you cross that death threat line, that's when it got absurd. That is absolutely crazy. I don't understand. That's pretty nuts. What drives someone to give death threats over video games? Yeah, there was a reason we haven't gotten things like GOG Galaxy, like actual native GOG Galaxy. As much as I love Mini Galaxy, there's a reason there wasn't a Witcher 3 or Lennox. Witcher 3, I will say, works great through Wine and Proton. I will say that. This is a major win, and I'm glad to see it. And I'm glad to see even as dynamically bipolar opposites of our company's approaches to Lennox, like Epic and like Valve. Valve is very much in the camp of let's throw basically the entire baby in the bathwater into Linux kind of deep end. And Epic is like, oh, we'll give this like one open source project that does some video game stuff some money. <laughs> It's cool that like Lutris got like that mega grant of like 25 grand. That's awesome. But Valve is the reason we don't have crappy graphics anymore. <laughs> so it's like there's a dichotomy of like company support kind of deal. But to see that kind of get pushed to the wayside though and be like, okay, we'll support the platform because of this one thing that this competition basically is doing. Because really when you look at Valve and Epic, their market overlaps with things like the Epic Game Store and Steam, obviously. To see that kind of get pushed to the side and be like, okay, we'll do this for this platform. It is really, really cool. Man, it's really awesome. I'm pretty excited to see what's going to come of this. I just got another Steam survey. I don't get them for months and months at a time. Then I get one month after another. Don't know what's going on here. I'm interested in seeing what happens after the Steam Deck launches. I'm interested in seeing like how the release of these anti-cheat systems, how well they actually work for everybody. I mean, there's so many things I'm really interested in seeing like how these things are moving into place. I mean, is it going to be a whole new world for Linux gaming? Is it actually going to be, or is this going to be another part of me? I'm not a pessimist, but a part of me is a little concerned. Like I've had these feelings in the past where I thought something good was going to happen and then nothing came of it. I want to temper my expectations and my excitement. I kind of don't want to be disappointed again looks so good. It looks so promising. And I just, I don't know if that makes any sense, but I'm just concerned that maybe it's, it's too good to be true. It does make sense. We have been disappointed in the past by something that's like, oh yeah, this is going to be so great. And then it turns out not to work as well as they say it's going to. A lot of this, I think, centers around what's going on with the Steam Deck. There's been some extra push, maybe some talking on the back end to help get that through. And my only hope is it will be as good as we're hoping it is because there's communication between companies. All I can say is the thing that makes this really interesting to me is when you can get somebody... The guy who helped basically made Rust, the game, not the language. He has never been the biggest fan of Linux. He literally talked about how easy it was to get EAC to work on Linux with Rust using a Steam Deck. That's praise from somebody who does not praise easily. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. It's very promising. The caveat, I think, is it's on developers the other caveat is it's on Linux users to approach those developers in a constructive way to make sure they're at least, even if they're not going to officially support the OS, at least turn it on. Honestly, I think I'd be fine with that. In short, you're saying the resources are there. The developers now have the option to turn it on. And if it's not being turned on in games that players are interested in, they need to nicely ask the developer if they will turn on those features. It's all about the approach. Demand and ask, two different things. Sometimes you need the demand in order to ask, just to have the support like we do now, or you actually need to ask, because sometimes the developers only think about turning it on, because it, however it may or may not be there. I don't care if games officially support stuff, don't officially support stuff. I've been using Proton at this point since day one. At this point, if it works amazing, mm -hmm. awesome. That's what I care about. I would love to see developers get involved in helping support Proton and you know even Linux native gaming if they so choose that route. Just getting it out into the consumer's 
not locking consumers into one platform like we have been for so long when it comes to gaming. I'll probably get flack for this, but I don't consider Mac gaming just because of the way the hardware is approached. I think there's a lot of people that feel that way, though. I don't think you're the only one when it comes to not considering Mac a real gaming OS. It seems to be more in the line of a creator business OS. That is where even Apple is focused. Nothing wrong with that. I guess I could just get annoyed when I hear people constantly like, oh, well, you can't game on Linux or, you know, you can't game on X. And they tell it like Mac OS is the alternative. If you actually look at the supported games on Mac and compare them to even generic games on Linux, even if you're doing Proton, the amount of games you can play on a Proton-enabled Linux OS far outweighs all the Macintosh games. People don't hold Mac to the same standard. Oh, I can't play my entire gaming library, so why would I switch to a Mac? Well, I can't play my entire gaming library. Why would I switch to Linux? The comparisons boggle my mind sometimes. Also, I'll make the point that EAC is now available for Mac OS too, which is, that's props. More options, more platforms, more openness is something we should all be for. As far as the consumer at the end of the day, the purchaser, the person having choices go where they go and not be locked into a single solution, primary OS especially, where they use their software is a heck of a win. This episode of DLN Extend is brought to you by Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the passive manager we use and trust. It's the easiest, safest way for individuals, teams, businesses, and organizations to store their passwords and other vital sensitive information. Bitwarden lets you choose the authentication to access your password manager, such as PIN, master password, and adding phrases or fingerprint security, all to keep your passwords safe. Go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started for free. Bitwarden is a password manager that I use and trust because Bitwarden is 100% open source. It has extensive security audits. It gives you the ability to self-host if you so choose. So go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started for free. It's only $10 for a premium account, which gives you one gigabyte of encrypted file storage, two-step login with YubiKey, U2F, Duo, Vault Health Reports, and more. Make the smart move like many from the community have and go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started for free. If you're like me, you'll want to show your appreciation by signing up for the Premium Edition, especially since the Premium Edition starts at only $10 annually. Bitwarden has saved me from getting into a serious jam numerous times. Now, you wouldn't be able to pry it from my cold, dead device. Thanks to Bitwarden for sponsoring this episode of DLN Extend. While we're busy getting things like EAC and everything else, kind of killing those stupid myths about you can't game on Linux, Wendy, what have you got going on with your interest? I just bought a brand new game, and let me tell you what, it looks totally dumb, and I'm excited to play it. It's called Zombie Serial Killer Incident. It's on sale right now at the time of recording, Wednesday, September 29th, for 99 cents. I think it will still be on sale by the time this drops and it's one I've had in my wish list for a while and the starting price really isn't that much but basically you are above the zombies you're protecting the quote-unquote damsels in distress as you shoot the zombies it's very very cartoony super silly graphics I almost think of it in the way of the silly zombies from Plants vs. Zombies. So you have some with different names, different head shapes. You still have some with the buckets on their heads. But instead of having the plants eat them, your mouse moves around as your crosshairs. You have to do some strategy-wise to make sure that your non-zombie ladies don't get eaten. Super silly. Graphics are fun. I had like a buck fifty sitting in my Steam account in my Steam wall. And I'm like, heck. Why not? <laughs> I need to just de-stress lately. Let's shoot some zombies. Well, looking at the game, it looks like one of those kind of games that you'd have bundled in, like in the early days of Windows, you know, and you'll learn how to use a mouse. It kind of looks like one of those unplug yeah. kind of games where you just do a simple thing. It's a uh, kind of addictive. It's what it looks like to me anyway. I haven't got to play it yet. I was actually going to play before we started the show, but the audio was so loud, I couldn't figure out how to get the music turned down. I didn't see a setting <laughs> feature that way. So it's pretty basic as far as the game goes. So I couldn't turn the music down so I could also hear Matt at the same time. And I don't want to do 
what people do when they have hearing aids that don't work and just be like, yeah, uh uh-huh, sure, as I'm playing the game anyway, so I stopped the game. (laughs) Well, Nate, in fairness, everything to you looks like 8-bit anything. Not 8-bit, like 256 color games, like a VGA game. You have 256 too many colors. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> i just prefer green on black or maybe amber there you go now you got it right <laughs> you have your cane out too there nate oh it's a walker with the tennis balls on the end of it oh okay gotcha make sure you raise it and yell at the cloud i bark at the wind kind of bite the breeze no wonder you have an unhealthy obsession with open susa uh <laughs> <laughs> no there's no denial there <laughs> No, that sounded more like a groan of, I have no idea where to go from there. I don't. Gotcha. (laughs) Anyway, game definitely looks fun, Wendy. Definitely something I can see up your alley as far as playing. You'll have to let us know how it is to play when you actually are able to play it, whenever that may be. I know. I don't know why I keep buying games, because really, I tell you guys every week, I probably sound like a broken record. Oh my gosh, I didn't have time this week. Oh my gosh, I didn't have time this week. Yeah, broken record me. I know everybody's busy, and there are people that are busier than me, but gosh dang it, I'm busy. But I buy games anyway, in hopes of playing them sometime. Wendy, how do you think I got so many? <laughs> no kidding. I buy them thinking I'm going to play one day oh no i'm turning into matt i need to uninstall steam right now you're not gonna do that i think either your husband or your kids would not enjoy that <laughs> yeah my husband would come home sit down to play a game he's like wait wait where where did steam go what's wrong with the computer oh i deleted steam what i was turning into matt i had to correct my course now technically we do say you know, she's taking magneto's superpowers and i guess mine is you know, game enabling as everyone says it is so yeah you're just absorbing more energy from other things wendy <laughs> spending too much time together. How are the updates going in Cubicle Labs, Nate? Well, great. I just got another fun little device. It's from SparkFun. It's a serial basic breakout for flashing my ESP-based Sonoff devices. Particularly, I want to create some extension cords that I can control basically what's on the other end of it. And I don't want to use any sort of like proprietary or cloud service. So I got these inexpensive Sonoff devices, like six bucks each. And instead of using the app to connect them and then somehow trying to finagle it to work with Home Assistant, I'm going to take them apart because this is way easier and use some jumper cables and this device that's connected to my computer and then go through and flash the firmware on the ESP control chip. It's a lot of hobby boards are based on ESP stuff. And so I'm going to put something called test mode on there so I can just associate that with my home assistant, be able to turn things on and off, literally just switch, turn on and off. Things like the lights that I have built into my stand-up desk here in my studio and my retro vintage desk as well. And then whatever else. I bought, I think, four of them, four or five of these devices I'm going to flash and just see how it goes. I might control lamps with it. I don't know yet. Kind of excited. I don't know what to do with it exactly. All of these things. Things. Definitely my vintage desk and then like a few of the lamps and such in the house. I've never done this before, so hopefully I don't blow anything up or burn anything or let out the blue smoke because I'm actually pretty good at doing such things. I should have purchased two, I think, after I destroy the first one because I wasn't paying attention. Four jumper wires from this into the Sonoff switch and hopefully I can flash it properly without breaking the device. Just expanding the conveniences in my home slash cubicle labs a bit by bit, making everything smarter because... I'm not. You are smart, which is why you're putting in all of this automation. I love hearing about it. And it's really interesting the way you are adding some of that to your stand-up desk and all of the tweaking and stuff you're doing inside the cubicle labs. It really makes me want to do some home automation myself. Mainly the home automation I've heard about or you hear about on a regular basis is the stuff that's being done with the big name ones. I won't say them right now because if I do, then it It'll set somebody's off and they won't be <laughs> too happy about that. Right. Those devices I don't allow in my house. I think I've mentioned on here before when we first got our Spotify subscription, it came with a free Google Dot thing or whatever, one of their smaller home held devices. I didn't even open up. I turned around and resold it brand new because I didn't want the dang thing. I wish they would have just given me a discount on the service for a few months instead of saying sending me this stupid piece of hardware that I didn't want in my house. So I'm really interested in the ways that you are doing this without using those big name cloud services, data stealing services. That's really the rule. Everything that I have has to be able to function without the internet entirely. So I want to be able to disconnect the internet and not lose anything. So far, it's successful. I'm still working on how to do different triggers and whatnot. I'm still understanding Home Assistant and how to use some of its functions, but I'll get there bit by bit. I'll ask people for help because there's lots of smart people out there that actually know what they're doing and I can kind of sort of muddle my way through until I get some 
basic level of understanding. So will this become a write up on cubiclenate.com? Eventually, when I have something that's worthwhile. So using the Home Assistant OS that I'm using right now, I have run into some limitations. Things like I don't have the ability to install uh, Python applications. And that's a problem. I want to be able to install like a terminal so I can like, read out of what the different devices are actually saying, what communication is happening like real time. Yeah. I can't install this like, well, maybe I can actually. I have to think about that. Apparently there's a way to associate other GitHub repositories to Home Assistant. So I'm still learning. There's still so much to learn. But right now it does function. It does function well. Like even earlier before I started the show, as I'm walking through, I have my phone with me. I'm turning lights on as I go and then turning them off. I need to have them on motion detectors so I don't actually have to have my phone so it just can just follow me around. When I'm not, uh, you know, trying to make things smart around me because I'm not, Matt, you got some games here that you're playing, I see. Actually, the game that I played, duh, I actually finished this game up this past week. Oh. This game is part of a ongoing series called Tales of, which is the name of the series. This one in particular is Tales of Arise, which is a new action RPG from Bandai Namco. And it's a continuation of the Tales of Arise series, which have no narrative interlinks whatsoever. They're just just kind of like how Final Fantasy is just insert new number here kind of deal. They just change up the name. Mm. This particular one, I just spent 55 hours playing. That's a wow investment of time. <laughs> For sure. The reason I wanted to highlight particularly this game, though, not just because I obviously just finished playing it. This worked day one out of the box for Linux. It was released on September 10th. Enabled Proton. Click install. Click play and played every bit of it on Linux. That alone is enough reason to highlight it. But um, if you want a good combat system and a, I don't want to say convoluted story, a unique story and the way it's kind of told and approached, it is definitely one that I think has good pacing. The biggest problem is it can get kind of hard at times, but a little grinding, leveling up for those that are the non-gamers, Wendy, as it would be. Thank you. Grinding means leveling up. This is definitely a game worth getting. Would I say it's worth this $60 for the base game? Yes. There are some DLCs. I didn't really look at them because they mostly looked like costumes, which whatever, not my thing. And I can't see paying 100 bucks for just some costumes and some cosmetic stuff. That's interesting business plan right there for making more money off your game. Well, sometimes DLC is a lot of fun. So for Among Us, we've bought a little bit of DLC here and there, but it's not super expensive. And then my kids like to make fun of my one-eyed blue alien dog that's following me around, (laughs) which is hilarious. So I can see sometimes for DLC, those add-ons are a lot of fun. But in some cases, especially if the cost is pretty high, yeah, it doesn't make sense to be spending the extra money on that. Yeah, it's not DLC for me. Let's put it that way. It doesn't diametrically affect the experience of the core game, which I'm fine with. Neither does my little blue one-eyed dog, but he's cute. (laughs) It brings a smile to your face, and that's what matters. Wendy, two things. The one-eyed dog part and the blue part. You might want to go get him checked at the vet if that's the case. He's an alien dog. I know. Wouldn't be me unless I was making sarcastic jokes. (laughs) But this is definitely a fun game. I enjoy a lot of it. Like I said, worked day one on Linux, played all on Linux. That's the aspect of what we were talking about earlier that I love to see, where it's just like, I can play this on Windows, I can play this on Linux, and it doesn't matter. With the saves and everything else, it's literally jump from one machine to the other. I can stream from one machine to another, and it doesn't matter. That, to me, is the experience I'm going for. I love the experience of playing this game. I would say it's definitely worth the 60 bucks. It doesn't look like my style of game. Zenith, that's more my style. It's too new. Yeah, it is too new. Even Zenith is too new for you. September 9th, 2021. That's quite newly released for sure. Even about 10 years. Uh, You forgot the two in front of the 10. 210 years. Well, I won't be alive that long. 210 years? Nate, if you are still around in 210 years, you have the secret to life or they figured out how to cryogenically free somebody and bring them back. No, see, Nate's secret to life will be the unhealthy obsession with open Susa. <laughs> oh, that's how he's going to survive, huh? <laughs> <laughs> a raspberry pie run by open Susa. No, it's a 6502. It's, you know, the same thing that's in the Apple II and the NES or 6510 if it's a Commodore 64. Nate, I was going to give you the Motorola 68000 there. That's uh, too new for me also. That's modern computing for me. Monochrome or nothing. (laughs) That's right. Or 16 colors. 16 colors of the Commodore 64. That's all you need. 
We'd like to continue the discussion with you on Telegram, in Discourse, Mumble, or Discord. Visit the DLM website for more information on how to connect to the social channels and all our shows and creators at destinationlinux.network. If you'd like to hang out with us on our preferred social media, see the links at the bottom of the show description, or drop us a message on the contact form by visiting dlnxtend.com slash contacts. Be sure to check out the DLN merch store. Grab yourself some awesome DLN swag along with stuff from other shows across the network. As always, we thank you for joining us and we'll be back next week with another awesome episode of DLN Extend. Until then, have a great week, everyone. still have a local backup just in case because i don't want to be burnt like that again <laughs> thanks riverside uh, yeah absolutely in a way it's, it was kind of a blessing in disguise because i mean now we found because of that issue now you found a, a more open sourcey friendly thing yes i'm actually really really happy with what came out of it it was just kind of a not so fun incident but i mean that happens right in this case wendy though you could you could blame me because that was actually on me <laughs> Yeah, because it was your recording. You did it on purpose, Matt. Oh, you totally. just hate me. Oh, totally. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Now, if it was me, yeah. Well. Totally agree. Nope, hate it. It's all garbage. <laughs> Start yeah. over. Games. Who plays games? <laughs> Nobody plays games. Games are dumb. I never play games. I never talk about games. We never talk about games on the show. There's just no games. Why are we talking about games right now? I don't know. Weird. Weird.